This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Sometime in late 2001 or early 2002, I announced to the online world that was following me at the time, and I had a blog that had been up for about five years, I announced that I was writing a book. And in my mind, it was as if Jim Collins had called out the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal. I announced that I was writing the book, which thus meant I must do the book. I created an only option situation for me. The only option, write the book. Now you're talking about a guy who had never above a C in English in college and really had no writing experience other than five years of a blog, but that still wasn't exactly book writing experience. At the time, the best thing I could think to do was to hire a ghostwriter. So I took all the writings that I had, all the ideas that I had, and I hired a ghostwriter. I gave this person one year to go come up with something, or I don't know, 10 months or so. At the end of 10 months, what was delivered was not what I imagined, not what I could ever see being a book. At that moment in time, the big, hairy, audacious goal, the BHAG went into overdrive, because now I've already announced that I'm going to do this book, and now I don't have a book. So at that moment in time, you learn how to write really fast. Because if you don't, you fail. But right at the same time, this ghost-ridden first draft that ended up becoming nothing of my first book, Trend Following, right at the time that was delivered, I received a random phone call email from the chair of finance at the University of Southern California, Larry Harris. And Larry told me, that more people were downloading his white paper on zero-sum trading from my websites than anywhere else he asked me if I could review his book. At that moment in time, I said to him, sure, as long as you introduce me to your publisher. He was kind enough to do that. He introduced me to his publisher at Oxford University Press. Oxford University Press was going to be my first publisher for my first book. We got that close to signing a deal. We had the paperwork. At the last moment, they pulled out. Now, this is not going well, right? For a first launch, for a first book, one year lost to a ghostwriting adventure that did not pan out. Now, I'm right at the point where I'm about to sign a deal, not for much money, maybe $10,000, but right at the point in time where I'm about to sign the deal, they pull out. Now, of course, I already had visions of my first book being published by Oxford University Press. How cool is that, right? Again, the guy with never above a C in English in college. But when he pulled out, I did something cavalier or not crazy, but I knew that what he had done was not right. I didn't like it. It was not above board to pull out at the last second like that for no reason. At least that was my view. Maybe he had a completely different view from his corporate take. But I challenged him. I said, hey, listen, this isn't right. You need to introduce me to a new publisher right now. He did. He introduced me to a guy named Jim Boyd at Pearson, Financial Times, Prentice Hall. All those names making up one publisher, yes. But he introduced me to Jim Boyd, and Jim went ahead and said, Mike, we will let you write this book trend following. Tell us what it's roughly about. We'll give you $15,000. And in April of 2004, my first book, Trend Following, came out. That book has gone on to sell over 150,000 copies. Quite a freaking accomplishment, if I do say so myself. But there's been a lot of twists and turns along the way ever since the first edition came out, April 2004. See, that first edition was not in the bookstores. There was no Borders bookshop. No bookstores were carrying it because... I was an unknown author with no credibility. But with such great sales out of the gate, sales that everyone could see and measure, we had to figure out a way to get the book into the bookstores. What was the idea? A second edition. And in the fall of 2005, 
about a year and a half later, the second edition came out, which we were able to talk our way into the bookstores. And what I did for that second edition was expand the book, rewrite the book, make it better. I mean, along the way, I'm learning, right? I put the first book out as best that I could. But now that I'm a published author, you start to get that idea of like perfection. I'm going to pursue this sucker till it's the best. Well, roll forward a few more years. It's time for the paperback edition. Yes, contractually, authors are usually obligated to deliver a paperback version within a couple years. Not a great idea, in my humble opinion, but that's the way the publishing world works. So early 2007, the paperback edition comes out. Now, this same year, my Turtle Trader book came out, so I had a lot going on, as well as a documentary film. Now, roll forward a couple more years, we get to the fall of 2008, and I remember after October 2008 hit, and so much good trend-following evidence now appeared, I called the publisher up and I said, hey, we need another edition. This would be the fourth edition. We need another edition right now. He obliged. The fourth edition came out in early 2009 which was also a major expansion of content, a continual rewrite. Now, I'm five years into this book, this never-ending book. Of course, you see things that you wrote in 2003 that look like shit, and you just want to cut and edit and make better, which I did. Then roll forward almost seven or eight years, a ton of other projects on my plate, including this podcast, And in the fall of 2016, now owning the rights to the trend-following book, Pearson, my publisher, even though the book had done extremely well, was moving on to whatever, and I was able to obtain the rights essentially for free. In the summer of 2016, I approached Wiley, and I said, let's do this. Let's get this sucker out. Let's get this new edition of trend-following. Now, Wiley being a little skeptical, but Clearly interested because they know this is a title, trend following, that has sold very well for almost 10 years. What are you going to do different, Mike? I said, well, for one thing, this has got to be hardback, hardcover. Because every edition of my trend following book for the last four or five years had been paperback. So I told Wiley, let's make this a hardcover edition. A big addition. They said, well, what do you mean by big? And I said, twice the content. I said, I will rewrite the book to the best of my ability, but I will expand the content by twice. So the book went from approximately 100,000 words, the 2009 edition, which many people have, to 220,000 words for my 2017 edition. It's not the same book. Oh, yes, you're going to recognize certain things if you had an earlier copy. But this is my best effort at providing the depth, the comprehensive depth of everything that I've seen about trend following in one edition. And as I just said, it's times two. The hardcover thing was huge for me. I wanted to have a book that people could put on the shelf and see it and know they must keep it. They must keep it for themselves as the ultimate reference. They must be able to give it to their family members. The type of book that you don't want to throw away. Because we all have those books you want to throw away. But what is the book that you can put on the shelf that you're proud of, that you don't want to get rid of ever? And that's what I delivered, in my humble opinion. And I'm not being too cocky, but in my humble opinion, that's what I delivered with my April 2017 edition of trend following. Yes, the edition comes in three formats, the hardcover, the Kindle, of course, and the audiobook. They're all very different. My opinion, I love the hardcover. I love a physical book more than anything. But I have seen that in this busy, busy world, audiobooks are huge. People love to digest their content in that way. So to give you an idea of what the Trend Following Edition 2017 sounds like in audiobook, I want to introduce you to three chapters of that book. Chapter 12, chapter 13, 
and chapter 14. These are three great traders, three trend-following legends. Ed Sakota, Martin Luke, and Jean-Philippe Bouchot. Three guys that know an absolute immense amount about the subject of trend following, markets, speculation, efficient market hypothesis, behavioral finance. These guys have been there in the trenches for decades. If you don't know anything about trend following, they are great places to start. If you know something about trend following, I promise you, they will absolutely remind you of things you might not have known about or forgot about, or they will say it in a way that you never really thought about. I'm so fortunate to have the access to these types of minds to include in my material. Because when I look at my world, and tell me of you out there, if I did not go down this trend-following path, who was going to? Who was going to get the access? I feel myself fortunate and a little bit lucky because if I did not start at the time that I did and get behind the scenes and meet certain people, who's to say this would have ever been exposed? Who's to say these insights ever would have been aggregated? I'm really not being cocky or trying to toot my own horn. I'm just saying there's this weird thing that happens in life where sometimes an individual that could be myself or you, you out there, whatever venture it is, one person can make a difference. And if that one person doesn't go down that path, certain things might not unfold the same way. Again, I feel so fortunate that so many people in this industry have trusted me to do the right thing, to say it the right way, to give a little edge if needed, to dial it back a little bit if needed. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. But as I have described in this introduction to chapters 12, 13, and 14, I don't stop. Getting my trend-following book right has been an adventure since literally 2001, 2002. So if you've not yet had a chance to see the 2017 edition of Trend Following, participate in the cause, the cause of keeping me motivated and the cause of educating yourself. And for those of you that have the hardcover edition, what follows again is my introduction to the audiobook version, the audiobook version of Trend Following 2017, chapters 12, 13, and 14 with Ed Sakota, Martin Luke, and Jean-Philippe Bouchot. I hope you enjoy. To act without needing a reason, to sit without knowing how, to ride the current of what is, this is the primal virtue. Zhuangzi, the second book of the Tao. Trend following is my fun. But along the way, I stumbled into another passion, interviews. During the writing of my second book, Turtle Trader, and during the production of my film, By Necessity, I developed interview skills. And in 2012, after my fourth book, The Little Book of Trading, I launched a podcast. It has gone far beyond trading to Charlie Rose guest diversity. Now, with 5 million plus listens, topics run the gamut investments, economics, decision making, health, human behavior, and entrepreneurship. My guests have included Nobel Prize winners Robert Allman, Angus Deaton, Daniel Kahneman, Harry Malkowitz, and Vernon Smith. James L. Toucher, Dan Ariely, Robert Cialdini, Kathleen Eisenhart, Mark Faber, Tim Ferriss, Jason Fried, Gerd Gigerenzer, Sally Hogshead, Ryan Holiday, Jack Horner, Steve Kotler, Michael Mobison, Tucker Max, Stephen Pinker, Barry Ritholtz, Jim Rogers, Jack Schwager, Philip Tetlock, and Walter Williams have also appeared. I would argue that my collection of interviews with trend-following traders and behavioral pros, the core thrust of trend-following, is second to none. That's why, with his new edition, I include curated interviews. Think market wizards, but for trend-following. These seven market pros, 
Bring the trend following wisdom you must know. Chapter 12, Ed Sakota. Chapter 13, Martin Luke. Chapter 14, Jean Philippe Bouchot. Chapter 15, Ewan Kirk. Chapter 16, Alex Gracerman. Chapter 17, Campbell Harvey. Chapter 18, Lassa Heja Peterson. Chapter 12, Ed Sakota. Edward Arthur Sakota, see Chapter 2, pioneered systems trading using early punch card computers to test ideas. In his influential bestseller, Market Wizards, Interviews with Top Traders, author Jack Schwager devotes a chapter to Sakota and writes that his achievements must certainly rank him as one of the best traders of our time. Michael, I know you look at trend following from not only a trading perspective but a life perspective. Ed, I think if you're going to really be a trend follower, you're going to have a lot of trouble limiting it to one area. Because let's say you have a trend following system. You say, I'm going to have a diversified portfolio, a trend following portfolio. I'm going to free myself up from emotions. Emotions have always been a big problem here, so I'm going to have a diversified trend following portfolio or I'm going to invest in somebody else's portfolio, and that's going to fix this emotional problem. Then what happens? Their investment or their portfolio goes up and down, and they get emotional problems with that. You don't really fix your emotions by having a system. What you do is you just move them upstream. You have constituents within the portfolio that used to bother you, and they went up or down, and then now you have a portfolio that goes up and down, so you just move the problem upstream. Ultimately, you have to say, what is it that I'm feeling, and what do I do when I feel these things, and can I come up with better and more useful or productive ways of responding when things goes up and down? Eventually, you get to come to terms with that. The best trend followers are the ones that have made peace with themselves, this is what I do in the case of things going up or down, with the value increasing and decreasing. This is how I behave, and this is how I act. And of course, as you know, there are all kinds of things you can do when things go up. Some people, when something goes up, they sell. Some people, when things go up, they buy. And when they keep going up, some people sell more and some people buy more. And if you go to extremes in either of those cases, you're counterproductive, self-destructive. You've got to know how to do that, and you've got to do it consistently. You've got to do it in your personal life. If you do these things in your personal life as well, it supports trend following. Because if you're not in alignment between your overall philosophy, how you behave as a person, and you try to do trend following, there's going to be conflicts. And so we in Trading Tribe hardly ever talk about actual trading or what the markets are doing. What we're working with is the emotional reaction to volatility or emotional reaction to loss or to structure or authority or all these other issues. If people straighten these things out, their relationships with their significant others or their children get better. They report more satisfaction in all areas of life. And, oh, incidentally, their trading is getting better. They don't quite know how that happened, but they've turned into a person that now can cope with uncertainty and can cope with volatility and they couldn't do it before. You can't take a system and use that to medicate your feelings. Some people say, I'm just going to suppress my feelings. Stiff upper lip approach, grin and bear it, or clench your teeth and hope for the best. I tend to go the other way. What's the positive intention to these feelings? Celebrate them. Find out the positive intention, and as soon as you do that, the feeling disappears, and you go on to the next feeling. I'm more of the go-with-the-flow on the feelings as well. There's a lot of different approaches. By now, after we've been doing this a couple of decades, we're developing a body of knowledge on how to do this and to what extent can we actually reprogram response patterns, and we're getting pretty good at this. You can follow what we're doing. I've put it all on my blog at www.sakota.com. All of this is free if people want to go on there. And we're documenting the growth of all kinds of people that are using this technology, and it seems to be, to the extent they use it, working pretty well for them. Michael, it always seems to me the place that one is trying to find is just some peace and contentment. 
to be able to sit in a room and not have this anxiety, worrying constantly. And if one has that, to work on that. I see parallels to your work in meditation when I read Zen scholars like Alan Watts. It seems like there's commonalities with some of your work and the Eastern thought process. Do you see that? Ed. I believe every feeling has a positive intention. For instance, if you're in the house and you smell smoke, you hear crackling sounds and notice the temperature going up in the room, and you conclude that maybe the house is on fire. That would be a really good time to feel anxiety, take some action, and respond to it. I'm not so sure you want to medicate your mind, anesthetize yourself, and put yourself into a meditative state where you don't respond. That's not really what I'm saying. You want to notice the feeling you're having in the moment and act appropriately, and you want to learn the difference between medicating a feeling and responding to it proactively. I'm not suggesting you always aim towards peacefulness. Sometimes you want to get busy. You might want to get busy and put a trade on, or you might want to get busy and take some corrective action, some risk control. Or you might want to take some action and get into some opportunity. Whatever it is, you can learn to come into harmony with your feelings, and to some extent, it's nice to just be able to be peaceful and watch your feelings and watch your mind and rest. It's important to rest, particularly when you feel tired. I don't recommend using either Trading Tribe Technology, which I call TTP, the Trading Tribe Process, or anything else for medicinal purposes like a drug or alcohol or a sedative. There's a difference between using any of these technologies as a sedative, and I don't think any of the Zen masters really recommend blissing out and staying there permanently. I think they want to be a little bit responsive and proactive to whatever feeling arises in the moment. Michael I love constant learning. What's the better way to handle expressing oneself? There's always a better way to do it. Ed I think so. I try. We're here in the moment. I'm learning something from you and I'm trying to be responsive. I'll think about this later and say, Oh man, I really could have said that better. But that's how life is. I do the best I can in the moment, and then I go back and maybe do it differently next time. I try to learn and study my responses and say, can I change the response? And that's what we do in the trading tribe. We try to look at what our responses are to our feelings, and then we practice identifying what it is we are doing, how are we getting the results we're getting, and can we change our response patterns and get different results next time around. Michael the only way you can learn is to extend yourself in front of somebody who has more experience. And once you extend yourself, there's the chance that you might be forced to learn something that makes you feel like, wow, why didn't I just say it that way? I could have said it the way he just told me. But you wouldn't get to the point of knowing the better way until you've extended yourself the wrong way. Ed, you set up an environment in which the goal is for people to help each other improve. This is true in the trading tribe, and some companies have this down pretty well. Some other organizations, too, where personal growth becomes important. People may correct you or offer advice, and you say, thank you for helping me learn something. In a lot of situations, somebody will correct you or give you advice, and then you get upset about it. You may say something to protect yourself, put them down, swear at them, tell them to keep their distance or whatever. When you have an expansive economy and a company that's growing, everybody's trying to do better than the culture in that company. When you have growth, when you have a free competition society and free competition, you have a competitive startup firm. And somebody says to somebody else, there's a better way to do this, and they say, thank you for telling me. And they start doing it that way. When you get a survival company, one that's overly restrictive and political and there's regulations, you better mind your own business and don't go talking to somebody else about what they should be doing. The environment in one case is pro-personal growth and pro-learning, and the other one is not. It's very territorial and very defensive. You can walk into companies and you can sense this right away. Some are open to grow and then they get mature. And if they start getting to the Govopoly model, and they start going the other way... Michael one of the things that you do in your Gavapoli book is talk about the strategy of trend following, and you offer trend following as a means to cope as we move towards this Gavapoli system that you see as inevitable. But I would love for you to go back in time a little bit, if you will, because you've had an interesting career. 
You've had some interesting mentors, interesting students, but there's a couple of traders in your early years that had a really strong influence on you. I would love for you to share wisdom or memories about two gentlemen in particular, and that'd be Amos Hostetter and Richard Donchian. Amos Hostetter, he was at Commodities Corporation, and Richard Donchian at Hayden Stone, two very accomplished early pioneers in the field of trend following. Ed, I'd be glad to share what I know. I knew Donchian a lot better than Hostetter. Donchian had noticed this system, the two-week rule in copper. The two-week rule? You buy something when it makes highs for two weeks, and you sell it when it makes lows for two weeks. I asked him once, how did you come up with the two-week rule? And he said, I don't exactly know, and you're the first person that's ever asked. He said that he just kind of came up with it, and I think that was the start of automated trend following coming up to the two-week rule. Before that, you can look at some of Livermore's writings, and he had another system of pivot points. Donchian basically started the two-week rule. Now, that won't work today. Back then, you had different characteristics in the markets. And the two-week rule used to work in copper, and then we found that you had to lengthen those, and maybe made the weeks longer, six weeks, or sometimes 30 or 40, 50 weeks, or much more than that. Donchian had this system and a couple of followers in his office. He didn't always follow it himself, but he had this system, and he had people that were religiously following the system, and they seemed to do pretty well. I came along and I studied his rule set. I had Donchian's rules and guidelines. And at about that time, computers were starting to become within reach for people to use them, although they didn't have personal computers. They did have mainframes at some companies. And if you can believe this, I got to go into the major brokerage house at the time on the weekend, and I had access to their mainframe computers that they used to run the company. There was a security guard, and there was me, and I had access to the complete computer base of the whole company. I was just using it to do computer testing. Michael, were you pinching yourself at that time? Ed, no, I thought it was just normal. I want to do this research, and they said okay. In those days, nobody ever thought about anybody trying to go in there and do anything nefarious. I was just in there doing research. In those days, you wouldn't even think about doing something like that. But these days, you couldn't get anywhere close to the inner workings of a brokerage house. I used all their disks, their history, and everything. They were just sitting around in this big room. It was a huge room with all these mainframe computers and the tape drives and so forth. You probably have more computation power in your cell phone now. In those days, that was quite the thing, so I would run back tests that you could now do in probably a second or two. It would take half an hour, 45 minutes to do one set of tests, and I was using punch cards. It was a different era back then. Michael. During the early days, there weren't a huge number of peers that you could bounce ideas off. You knew Donchian, but unlike today, where there's a much wider network and people are connected on the internet, you didn't have that then. Ed. I took Donchian's work. He had a letter that he would publish. Every week he would publish a letter which would have his rules on it, and it would also have a kind of model account and you could follow along. And the idea was you would follow along and place your orders with him. I guess that was the way that was supposed to work. I tested his rules and came back and said, the rules internally are not consistent. You can't program all these rules at the same time because they conflict with each other. I started taking rule sets that were non-conflicting. I tried to tune it up and say, here's what we can do, and I would try different experiments with the rules. Then I would check it with some brokers and traders in the office, and I'd say, I'm going to change this. I'm going to make this system less responsive so the market has to go up more before you start to buy it, make the time constants longer. And people would say, that's going to make it more risky because your stops are going to be further away. Then we would test it and we would get the exact opposite results. All these things were very counterintuitive. I did some of the first testing and you're right. There wasn't any standard. Now I've got this on my website and if you want to replicate some of these tests and learn how to do it, you can. There's a template and you can do it on your Excel spreadsheet or whatever. Enough people have done it that they all get the same result to the penny, so I'm pretty confident I've got the right answer up there. In those days, there wasn't anybody else. I was just curious, and I said, how does this work? 
and Donchian had set it up as a system. I said, okay, I'm going to simulate it. I'll go back in the computer and see if I get the same results that Donchian's getting. I'll try to set up a diversified portfolio, and we did that. The company I was with marketed it for a while. We had a diversified portfolio, and it was all run on computer by a service bureau. We would enter the data every day, then get the result, and then we would put the orders in. The company I was with couldn't stick to it, and they also couldn't resist the temptation of trying to get the customers to trade more often than the system wanted them to trade. The problem with this system was it worked, and it made money for the clients, but the problem was it made far less money for the brokerage house. Because they were used to day traders, they were used to people coming in and lasting a few months, losing their money, moving on, and doing something else. That's the way the brokerage house was set up. People would come in, try to trade, lose their money, and leave. They said, the commissions are like a tenth of what they used to be. They're just staying the positions, and this is going to wreck our business model. And so there were all kinds of pressures to get people to trade more often, like you pointed out in some of your letters to me. Well, they've got fancy names for it now, like disposition effect. But in those days, people just didn't want to hold on to something. It would go up a little bit, and they would want to take their profit. Went down a little bit, and they wanted to add more and hope it'll go back up. You had lots of pressure against following systems in those days, and so I invented something that no one really wanted. Then I left and I went out on my own, found clients, and I found that some of the most important things was developing a relationship with the clients. So they knew what to expect and they knew what was going on. If the client was not aligned to it, and if you didn't have emotional rapport and understand the system is more than the mathematics, there was trouble. The system is the mathematics plus the willingness to follow the system. And when you increase your worldview to include the investor himself and his emotional responses to what's going on is when you finally get the system to include everything. You can design a system that works. But just going into a computer and tuning up their software and saying, here's the right set of parameters, well, great. You've got something that theoretically will work for some theoretical robot that'll follow it, but there aren't a whole lot of robots that have got money these days. Maybe someday. But right now, you've got human beings with human feelings, and unless you include that into your system design, the wheels are going to come off the cart around the corner. Michael, you sum up so much of your ethos in those last few sentences for those paying attention. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you've been highly motivated by the puzzle aspect of figuring things out. Ed, Yes, I like puzzles. I've got a huge collection of what you might call barroom puzzles. These metal detanglement puzzles where you have metal pieces that fit together and you've got to figure out how to get them apart or together. I've got a huge collection of those and in the morning I do chess puzzles. I just like figuring things out. That's always been something that I've enjoyed doing. I don't know exactly where that comes from. I've been able to incorporate that in my life in such a way that it's useful. I like the puzzle aspect of what I did in the markets or what I did with my Gavapoli book. It's what's driven me. I want to understand how it works. Then if it works and makes money, that's great. It's nice to make money. But I wouldn't have done it in the first place. I'd maybe figure out some other way of making money. But the puzzle was what got me. I said, I've got to figure this out. This guy Donchian, he's got this thing that's mechanical, it's making money. How can that be? How can you get something that's mechanical that can make money for nothing without doing any work? How can that be? And so I kind of got attracted to looking at it. I don't think I would have gone into it for just the money. It was the puzzle. It was, how does this work? How does this actually work? Can I build a model? Can I understand this? And then when you understand it, then it becomes interesting to explain it to people for a while, whether you put it on the website or you write a book, then you go on and look for a new puzzle. Michael, go back in time. You're in those mainframe rooms, and you're by yourself and you're struggling. There's got to be a struggle to try and figure this all out. Was it just pure excitement at the time? This internal excitement that was driving you to keep going and going till you got the puzzle solved? Ed, well, that's a good question. That's one of the best questions I've ever heard. What motivates somebody who's a researcher? What motivates them to go? Is it that pleasure or the puzzle, or is it the discomfort of not knowing? It's deeper than that. 
It's just that's what I do. That's what I do. I do that and I play banjo and I get lost in it. That's my meditation. I have to do it. If I can't play music, something dies. And the same with solving puzzles. That's who I am and that's what I do. And I don't think of it as there's something that pushes me to do it. That's just who I am and that's what I have to do. Michael. I sometimes feel like my career is the same way. I don't necessarily know why. I'm just driven to do what I do, and I'm not necessarily sure what I even do, but I just do it. Ed. I like that, and you're good at it. And that's one of the places we succeed in the trading tribe when we get people to this place you're at, where you find out who you are and what you do, and you just do it. You express yourself and create a value by expressing exactly who you are and not pretending to be somebody else. That's a very high state. Congratulations for being there. It'd be a different world if everybody could get there, and I would hope people would follow in your footsteps. I've watched your career over many years, and I've seen you keep expanding and getting closer to who you are, and now you're really blooming and you're really making a big contribution, so good job. Michael I'm not going to tell the exact story, but you influenced me greatly when I met you for the first time in 2001, and I can still remember some of the things that you said to me. And for some people, they might have felt threatened. I don't think I felt threatened. I was like, okay, what has he just said to me? Why is he saying it? What's the deeper meaning? In many ways, as you talk about your love of puzzles, I felt like you were giving me a puzzle. Michael, you might want to consider this. And so then, of course, I just considered that, and you didn't give specific instructions. You gave some big-picture insights. That's probably how you like to be. You want to see if there's more puzzle finders out there. Ed. Yes, and you're open. You wanted to do something. You wanted to go somewhere. You're on a growth path. And then you viewed ideas from me and other people. And you've surrounded yourself with an amazing group of people who have amazing amounts of ability, knowledge, wisdom, and resources. You've surrounded yourself with one of the most advanced group of mentors possible. You just like to do that. I think you had an attraction. You attracted people like that, and then you enjoyed hearing what they had to say. The people on your podcasts and people in your life all are people with strong opinions, all people that make you think and make you grow. You just have some kind of an affinity for people like that, and that's part of what makes you good at what you do. Michael. If they keep talking to me, I should keep talking to them. That seems like a good rule. If really smart people will agree to talk to me, I should probably talk to them because then I wouldn't be that smart. Laughter. Ed. Laughter. It seems to be working. I just love Ed Sakota. He is awesome. He gives the insights. Next up, Martin Luke of Aspect Capital. Martin Luke co-founded Aspect Capital in September 1997. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, Trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you. Martin. I was in the audience for that. Michael. That was probably an interesting audience. When you're on stage for one of those things, you're in your own little world, and you don't realize that's a pretty interesting audience, all trend followers at an annual event at that moment in time. Martin. Exactly. It's voyeuristic because you guys are having so much fun, and you could be in a bar, the three of you, and the rest of us are like voyeurs. Michael. I sometimes wonder if it is something that comes with age when you loosen up. Or do you think guys like Larry and Ed were always that way? Martin. A bit of both. 
Obviously, I don't know Ed at all, but Larry's always been older than me, and that will never change. Probably he's always been wiser than me, and actually I haven't seen him for a while, so whether he still gets wiser or whether he is sort of plateaued and that wisdom is enough to carry him through, I don't know. Michael. Yes, I have interviews with just me and Larry in his office that I can't release. They're awesome wisdom, but there's a lot of color there I can't put out. Martin. Yes, I can believe that. Michael, listen, it's a pleasure finally to speak with you. I have your book on my desk and have owned this for many, many years, so thank you for everything you've done for the industry. Michael. Well, thank you. Thanks for the nice words. Martin. I'm surprised we haven't spoken. Michael. Yes, I should share a quick story with you. The first time I met one of your old friends, the head of Winton Capital, I was in his office and it was 2005, and we had just met. It was just me and him and his dog. He started pulling up a screen showing me equity curves of assorted well-known USCTAs, and then superimposing his equity curve, and then just giving me that wry smile of like, did you somehow miss me? That was my first inkling of the London CTA scene, so to speak. Martin. Yes. Michael. There's been an exponential explosion of all you guys. That's just out of this world. Martin. It's an interesting story. Michael. When did you first know in your mind this quantitative style, this systematic style of trend-following trading, coding it and trading it over a diversified basket of markets? When did you know in your heart of hearts this had changed your life, or at least you knew this could make some money. Martin. Wow. Michael Adam, David Harding, and I never quite had the luxury, if you could call it that, of having a role model. It wasn't as though we looked out at the investment universe and said, I want to be that person, or I want to do that thing. Certainly for Michael and I, because we go back further than our relationship with David. We were at boarding school together from age 13, and then we were at Oxford together. After Oxford, Michael went to work for his father, who ran a small physical commodity broking business in London. I went and took my first job at Nomura, trying to sell Japanese equities to European investors. And I didn't know what an equity was when I started that job, clutching my physics degree. I was just fascinated by the analysis that Michael had started doing, prompted by his father. Michael's father said, Here, boy, buy one of those newfangled computers. Personal computers were just beginning to reach the shores of the UK in the 1980s, and Michael bought a Hewlett Packard 9816 personal computer. His father handed him a book of technical trading methods and said, See whether there's anything in this. It's really been so gradual. Just over time, I left Nomura and joined Mike. This whole time series analysis just lent itself to the nerdy physicist's approach. We just discovered some things. We tested every model that we could encode from that great book. We distilled them down to some fundamental rule sets. We tried them on a range of markets, and at that time, the range of markets that we had available to us sitting in the commodity world of London, what did we have? Cocoa, coffee, sugar, aluminum, copper, silver, something like that. The financial commodities were really in their infancy. Only a few years later, and largely once we'd met David, we started expanding the application of these models to a more diverse set of markets. Michael. People love that depth. People want to know what's going on inside the mind of early guys. Martin. There is no one moment where we said, Ah, yes, we have created the great imitator of... Who was around in those days? Richard Dennis, John W. Henry, the Mint Gentleman, Larry Height. But we didn't know that. As we started things, we didn't know there was that U.S. industry. Michael. Mid-late 80s? Martin. Even early 80s. I started working with Mike in 1984. He was working for his father from early 1983. The earliest AHL track records stretches from 1983. We met David, I want to say in 85 or 86, and there was a bit of a tussle. David was working for Sabre Asset Management and was the understudy to a great chartist, a man named Robin Edwards who ran a fund, very systematic but no computers involved, and David was a Cambridge-trained scientist, and he immediately saw the potential for using computers to encode Robin's chart approach. The Sabre folks tried to hire Mike and me out of Mike's father's business, and that wasn't going to happen, so in the end we got David to join us in Mike's father's business. 
And then, at the beginning of 1987, there was a little family tiff, which resulted in the three headstrong boys leaving with one client and setting up AHL. Michael. But at the moment you set up AHL, had you made enough money at that moment in time that you felt like, I've got a little breathing room, or was it still kind of, we're not really sure what's going to happen yet? Martin. We didn't have a bean. Not a bean. In fact, blood is thicker than water. Michael's dad had built this business over the years, and it had morphed from that commodity-broking firm into a small asset management business based on models the three of us were developing. He had a very, in those days, parochial or patrician's approach to managing money and to the clients. It was just a difference of opinion. We said, look, you can't behave that way with your client's money. You can't take a paternal view of it. You have to be completely transparent. And we set off on our own. But we didn't have a bean, and Michael's father actually lent Michael 20,000 pounds that we spent on computer gear and rent until we had generated enough fees that we could go and rent our own office and pay his father back. Gosh, it was a very long time before we had confidence in what we were doing, actually. Michael. A two-part question. What were you calling the style of trading amongst yourselves that you were executing? And number two, talk about some of the early coding and how you went about the early coding. This was not the age where you could walk out and buy TradeStation or Mechanica software. This was hard coding in the bowels, so to speak. Martin. Two parts to that. What did we call it? I don't know. Yes, it was trend following, and it wasn't long before we woke up to the fact that there was an industry here because we had friends in the brokerage community. Through Michael's father's connections, there was a metal broker in London back in the 80s called Rudolf Wolf. The roots of our managed futures was a client would open a managed account and give authorization for the manager, in our case AHL, to manage that money. It was brokers like Rudolf Wolf and some of the early physical commodity brokers that helped us and educated us in what the rest of the industry was doing. We knew pretty quickly that this was trend following, and we started to get exposure to a much broader set of markets. In terms of the modeling and the development, you had in Michael and me in particular real techie wonks. Certainly, I would not get a job now as a developer, but back in the day, that's what we loved to do. Those Hewlett Packard 9816s? Actually, the operating system was written in Pascal. And we learned Pascal and built our models in Pascal, and very quickly we built an environment that allowed you to encode trading ideas much more simply. You didn't need to write them all in Pascal and compile the darn thing and blah blah blah. It was effectively an inline simulation language which got developed in the days of AHL once we became part of the man group. And it was a well-funded exercise. We had code writers, developers just working on that interpreted language. So it was a precursor to many of those trade stations. And for a while, in the period between AHL and Aspect, certainly, Mike Adam had a version of that. Actually, it wasn't his, but it was a similar product that he was marketing commercially. The software development was very much intertwined with the model development. Michael. I was thinking about the notion of achievement. Everyone, if they're pushing in some way, is achieving. We're all striving, and it's sometimes hard to reflect on that because you're saying, hey, we just started doing this, and it starts working, and we just keep at it. We keep our nose to the grindstone, and there's some ups and there's some downs, and the next thing you know, 30, 40 years later, boom, 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 something interesting is there. And then for outsiders, they look back now and see the very successful firm aspect today, but they don't really think about the progression, the evolution. Martin. That's so true of so much in life. It's very hard to join dots when the dots don't exist. You can join the dots with hindsight. If I was being really glib, there was a while where it was just the three of us and none of us got those fancy jobs in investment banking that all of our slick friends at university got. There was a period where we were three scientists, nerding around with the models and the simulations, the back data, some of Michael's father's money, and, heavens, this stuff works. The more we got into it, the more animated and the more excited we got. So it was revenge of the nerds for a little while. Then it was an investment bank in a box, because in the early days of AHL we did a number of different things, not only model development and asset management. Michael was already keen on commercializing that piece of software. I spent a fair bit of time using the software to provide consultancy services for financial businesses, and what came to light 
was that you could fairly easily model the behavior and the profitability of investment banks. We did a piece of work for a London gilt trading house. We modeled how many people, their risk limits, what kind of investment horizon. They had the front book traders that were making a market, and they had the back book traders that were holding the house book, if you will, and we modeled the behavior of those things and said, roughly, this looks like the profitability of your business. And the folks, the executives, their jaws dropped. They went wide-eyed because we basically modeled their business. We went around telling everyone, Goldman, Salomon, just get rid of all your traders, they're very expensive, and they have hangovers. You can build it all on computers. We believed ourselves, of course, but everyone thought we were completely nuts. By and large now, that's what's happened. Michael. Today, Aspect is 100% systematic. I'm guessing that there was a moment when you're doing all this homework in the early stages of this industry and seeing the results, but when did you have that aha moment? Wow, we should really take the human discretion out and automate this. When was that moment? Martin. I draw attention to two things. The first was just an awareness that your ability to rationalize the available information, if you could do that pretty quickly and get rid of the noise, we'd all be much better traders. I tell a story about those early AHL days. Mike and I came up with a game, and it was just a piece of code that would randomly sample one of the markets in our database, and it might invert it and it might multiply it by a random factor. You couldn't tell what the market was, but it would obviously keep the integrity of the price series and it would present a chunk of time series to you. It would then ask you to buy or sell, and you'd buy or sell. Then it would move forward a day, and then you'd buy or sell, and move forward a day, and so on and so forth. And with that kind of rapid-fire decision-making, actually, we were pretty good discretionary traders. If you blow each of those ticks up into a 24-hour period, with news coming at you and fear and greed and the chaos of normal life, you become a lousy trader. That was the first inkling that taking the emotion out of it, just reducing it to the raw information, has to be a good thing. The second thing turns out to be the importance of risk management, because what a lot of people focus on in any model development is the models. Are you going long? Are you going short? How do you feel about this market or that? And that's all well and good, and you obviously need to develop those models and be able to articulate what the underlying drivers are, but what many people miss is the risk management component. What a lot of people do is focus on systematizing models, and then portfolio construction and or the risk management piece they leave to discretion. Somewhere in the genesis of aspect capital, we realized that's absolutely a crucial thing to get right. You need to be able to systematize not only your models that interpret the price data and determine the confidence you have in that particular trend, but you also need to be able to systematize your portfolio construction process and your risk management process. The manager that says, I am 95% systematic and 5% discretionary, is 100% discretionary. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying there aren't geniuses out there who are discretionary, but it means you can't rely on the scientific process. You can't rely on the quality and the integrity of the simulation and research process if there's the hint that you're just going to step in and downgear the portfolio when the going gets tough, or you're going to knock out a few markets when they seem to be a little off the charts. Because you can't build that into your simulation, and you can't know what you're going to do in the future. Although we knew at the outset that it was a good thing to systematize, I've become more resolute in how important it is across the entire investment process. Michael you talk about that notion of 95% systematic and some proportion of discretion. That was a very common marketing line in disclosure documents of trend following CTAs for a long, long time. It was this mysterious, we're 95% systematic, but there's also this magical 5% discretion, which is the reason you're giving us money. I always used to think that didn't make any sense. Now, because you and other peers, associates, etc., have gone the opposite direction and said, Hey, hold on. I don't think you could probably get away today saying in the trend-following space, we're 95% systematic. People that want to invest would probably say, explain that. Martin. It's really dependent on who you were talking to, and we all lived in fear in the early days of the black box label. Two things. 
I think that 5% discretionary was also to give some investors a sense there was a thought process, and it wasn't just this ignorant machine clunking away. But also I come back to the point that people build them models and then the overall risk target of the portfolio was something they would set discretionarily on how it felt that week, day, month, or epoch. Michael, it was a weird point in time where we had not yet got to the point where there was an acceptance of the 100% systematic. There was this gray area in the marketing, and for good or bad reasons, perhaps, as you're saying. Martin, that's exactly right. And now it needs to be used judiciously, so the idea of being systematic, the idea of being research-driven as an investor, as a consultant, doing your due diligence, you've got to scratch at that. Because as I give a bright young graduate an infinite amount of data and an infinite amount of processing power, they're going to come up with the works of Shakespeare, or they're going to come up with models that just look staggering. And you and I know that you wouldn't put your money in them. There is a difference between 100% systematic models that are based on curve-fitting, back-fitting, cloud patterns, data mining, versus 100% systematic models that are based on rigorous hypothesis extraction testing and a whole barrage of statistical tests to make sure that you aren't fooling yourself. Big, big difference. Michael, I have to give a presentation shortly in a country in Asia, a pretty successful city. And I assumed they knew what I was going to talk about, and they wrote me and they said, Hey, can you bring these particular charts for your presentation and tell us whether or not these charts are in a trend or not in a trend? It's amazing that people still want to fixate on their markets. They're excited about their markets, and they're not even thinking about diversification. That's not even on their horizon. They've just got their markets they're happy about, and they want me to tell them something exciting about them. That's not how you look at it. You were saying... What are the targets of opportunity? When that opportunity arrives, we're going to do something with it, but we can't force it. And I still think today, it's still not a widely understood concept. Martin. I think that's right. And I've been in exactly those situations where, whether it's the local conference organizer who's asking you to tell them how great their local market is, or it's the drinks party where somebody's saying, what do you think about gold? I don't even know what country I'm in and which way up your stock market is, but I know it's in my portfolio. And I know it's one of the 150-plus assets that we monitor 24 hours a day that we always have a position in. And depending on how those trends have unfolded, we will have a large position. And depending on how those trends have unfolded, we will have a long or a short position, and that's the beauty of it. Many managers will have a different approach from ours, but I start from the very high-level premise that all assets have an equal opportunity to manifest trends. The whole model-building process is an attempt to preserve that opportunity and make it as broad and robust as possible. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you build your model such that it captures some of the characteristics of different markets, you trade hogs subtly differently from how you trade treasury bonds, for example, you can persuade yourself that you are building in some features of those markets because clearly the world of hog traders is different from the world of bond traders. But the dynamics of those markets at that level of resolution, there is, in our opinion, no persistency. All you can say about hogs and bonds is they have the potential to demonstrate trends. If I had looked at, say, equity markets over, if my data set was, this is somewhat spurious, but let's say U.S. equity 2002 to 2007, I could conclude that equities don't go down, not for long. What if I looked at bonds over the last 10 years? Bonds don't go down, do they? Never. You could build into your model certain biases or certain scenario expectations, and that's what we try and eschew. We try and avoid those built-in biases. I am indifferent as to whether your regional equity market is in a roaring bull trend, which I know is what you want, conference organizers, or whether it's in a terrible bear trend. I'm agnostic as to whether it's going up or it's down, and I don't look at how different markets have performed historically and say, my models are better at trading commodities than they are at trading financials, and therefore I overweight the financials. I try and keep it as completely agnostic directionally and asset allocation-wise so that it can grab hold of any opportunity that presents itself. Michael, when you're talking to people after all these decades, what percentage of the educated financial audience do you think grasps what you do at Aspect? 
Martin. Fortunately, many more now. This is a terrible generalization and therefore probably not true, but from my small vantage point, 2008 was the aha moment, and before that, marketing what we did could sometimes be a struggle, and you know that. We also didn't help ourselves with the absurd fees that we used to charge back in the 80s. The evolution of that to making ourselves look respectable and I want to be a hedge fund too, all the way through to 2008, was where as a result of performance in 2009, the phone started ringing and the pension funds and the pension fund consultants that wouldn't take our calls up until that point said, explain again how this stuff works. And then they were really receptive. Of course, you can't make it up because then, ironically, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, you get a period where this stuff didn't perform as well as it had done historically and as well as our expectations would have led us to believe it can and it will. I think the vast majority of people now get what we do, but it wasn't until relatively recently that that's been the state of the world. Michael, I put this in one of my books that T.V. Ben Stein said, if you made money in 2008, you were doing something wrong. Martin, really? Laughter. Michael, I know where he's coming from, I understand from his understanding of assorted trading strategies or investment strategies, and if you only believe those, then that's a fair thing to say. You're leaving some things out to say that, but I just love that line. Martin. That is a great one, and none of us in our industry should think, and the respectable ones of us don't think, that we're ever finished. It's not like you've ever unlocked the secrets of the markets, and my model is my model, and now I'm off to the beach. Because A, the markets never leave you alone, and B, there's always some new thing that you hadn't thought about. I think very topical at the moment is the evolution of portfolio construction. The theory and practice of portfolio construction. The Swenson model of diversification was not just have U.S. equities, have global equities too. There you go, now you're diversified. I'm oversimplifying it. But certainly he has had, and as far as I know, has no interest in quant strategies, and at the time, that was perceived to be a very valid and very useful form of diversification. And in 2008, that's why you get lines like, If you made money in October 2008, you were doing something wrong, because the worldview was so rigid. It's exciting, it keeps me young, and it keeps my research team young and energized, because there's always some new worldview that you should explore. Michael, I've had some of the brightest and most accomplished behavioral economists on my podcast, and what I really find amazing in talking to them is their work seems to be the embodiment of traders like yourself, your peers, the other associates in the industry. Going down the systematic quant trend strategy path was in many ways capturing what Daniel Kahneman was winning the Nobel Prize for, or what Vernon Smith was winning the Nobel Prize for. But when I talk to them, there seems to be this disconnect where all these behavioral economists should be waking up to these quant trend strategies and saying, wow, what a wealth of interesting data and evidence for us to sink our teeth into. But there still seems to be a wall where they've not yet pulled the hood of the car up and looked under there and said, interesting. Martin. I agree, Michael, and viva la différence. I'm very happy that those folks and the folks at Google have not woken up to it. But you talk about behavioral economists One area that has sort of fascinated me is the building of agent models. If you can define players in your complex system, who are the hedgers? Who are the speculators? Who are the counter-trend traders? All of that. You'd think you could come up with a bottom-up model for the markets, which perhaps, but I don't know, is that what behavioral economists are trying to do? In my limited experience, candidly, don't bother. It's a very elegant mathematical model, but it's very unlikely to be able to make you any money. The thing about what we do is that it's a bit rough and ready. The models are very sophisticated, of course, and the mathematics is complicated, but you almost start from the premise that all markets will at some point display trends, and it's our job in these models to be able to capture those trends efficiently and not lose money in the periods where we're participating in those markets and they're not trending. There you go. I've just defined what it is we do, what you'll notice that I haven't dwelt on. And it's my job to tell you why those trends exist, where they come from and where they're going. If you fixate too much on that, which is the role of the behavioral economist, very fascinating field, but it's not what we do.
Michael. They seem to do a great job of really putting aside the efficient market theory and offering that human beings are not always rational, that bubbles exist. So I look at that very basic premise. Their work gets more complicated than that, but their basic premise, it dovetails right into your world in the sense that it's a foundational explanation for why you might be successful. Martin. Yes, and it is. And it makes for great reading, and often there are aha moments, as you say. Yes, well, that's why we sophisticated monkeys behave the way we do, and long may it continue. Michael. The world is a very interconnected place. Everyone is coming online. If a country doesn't have a liquid futures market, they're thinking about it. They would like one. How do you go about the process of bringing new potential trading opportunities into aspect? I imagine you always stay excited because you're like, hey, we don't even know the next group of markets from the next country that's going to come online that can possibly offer us opportunity. What's great about trend following in many ways, it is the Indiana Jones of trading. Once you have your models, your systems, and you know these markets in these countries are liquid and viable, you can go in. Martin. Yes, it's an ongoing process and something we devote a fair bit of time and a fair bit of money to, because you've got to keep your head up. It's relatively easy to get started with the 50 most liquid markets out there in the world, and if you just ignore all of the new stuff that you're referring to, you miss a huge opportunity set. As a business, we have a regular cycle of reviewing news alerts and our brokers keep us prompted of what's new, what's coming. We like to have some back data, so we're not going to be market participants on day one of an exchange opening, because we've got to get the sort of characteristic heartbeat of liquidity patterns within that market before we can parameterize our execution algorithms. We've got to establish a little bit of history, and then we've got to establish a threshold of viability. A threshold of liquidity because it's got to be worthwhile at a certain point, having a one basis point allocation to a market where it isn't viable in the program. There's a liquidity threshold. There's something like 6,000, is that right? 6,000 futures markets globally? You can very quickly cut off 80% of those on liquidity basis as being viable for what we do, and then it's an evolving cycle. As liquidity picks up, we will adapt our allocation in the portfolio. And the other feature, of course, is there may be constraints. For example, we can't currently trade the Chinese futures markets for our investors because external investors are not allowed to participate in those markets. Similarly, access to Brazilian futures markets, which are vastly liquid, but there's a taxation situation that makes them extremely difficult and expensive to trade. So all of those markets we're tracking, we're collecting data, we are simulating the models on them, and we're ready to go at the drop of a hat should the legislation change. We welcome that. We love the additional diversification that it affords the portfolio, because back to the starting point, if you just traded the same liquid 50 markets that maybe we started with in the 1980s, if that was your portfolio now and all other things were equal, you would have less diversification in the portfolio. There's a long-term secular trend towards markets becoming more homogenous over time, I believe. We are hungry for new access and new opportunities of diversification. Michael. Why do you think you're so passionate? Martin. I'm a one-trick pony. Laughter. This is what I've done in my career. I can't claim to be a scientist or a physicist, but that's what I studied. I got into that because I'm inquisitive. I like precision. I like answers. I like engineering solutions to things. I know myself, and I would be a lousy discretionary trader. I like the application of sophisticated mathematical techniques and theories to extract signal from noise, and I love working with a bunch of really, really smart, talented people. All of that keeps you passionate, to keep learning and to keep competitive, and to keep doing what you're doing better and better. Michael. Even if the economics of this was much less... Let's say it was good enough to earn a living. I get the feeling talking to you that this still would have been your passion and your path. Martin. Absolutely. This is just great fun. I didn't set out on day one to be a great trader at all. As I said, I got into this working for Michael's father because I was fascinated by the application of computers to time series data. That's what I've done my whole career. It really doesn't matter that rewards have been very good. That's a nice feedback loop. Actually, markets are a very swift judge of how precise and how honest you have been. So? Michael. It's how to keep score. Martin. 
is how to keep score exactly. That means that I'm not in an amorphous world of where people could say, Wow, what a great article you've written. There's a scorekeeper. Following on Martin's great insights, let me introduce Jean-Philippe Bouchot, a very interesting trend-following trader. Jean-Philippe Bouchot is a French physicist. He is the founder and chairman of Capital Fund Management, CFM, and is a professor of physics at École Polytechnique. Michael. I want you to elaborate on your physics background, but bring that into this framework of classical economics. Classical economics, the rationality of economic agents, the supposed rationality, the invisible hand, market efficiency. But for some reason, the idea of empirical data often gets left out of the equation. And I've seen this with some other traders that have had success. A physics background is different. It allows you to maybe look at the world through a wider lens. Jean-Philippe. Yes, exactly. I'm surprised that you say all of this because that's more or less what my usual message is and you've captured all of it in a few words. Yes, it is true that I'm a physicist by training and physics is of course learning through doing experiments. And you learn that theories are no good if they're not able to reproduce observations. And even if your theory is beautiful, if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. You just have to throw it in the dustbin and start again. As a physicist approaching economics and finance back in the early 90s, that's what struck me most, that it is a lack of statistical aspect to the way economics and finance theories are built, very much axiomatic in imagining how the world could be or should be, then developing the theories without much care about what's going on out there. I guess that for a while it was justified because data was not so easy to access, so the whole academic world has developed without data in a sense. And so people had to maybe supplement the lack of data by actions and by ways of thinking. That can happen too in physics, actually, so perhaps I was fortunate enough to enter the field when data became very easy to access. And when looking at data and trying to make sense of data through a kind of vivid light on the failures and drawbacks of efficient market theory and Gaussian statistics, black shoals, all of this to me was quite apparent. That it was not enough to understand the world. Michael. You mentioned the Black-Scholes model. It's still in use. So even though that systematic underestimation of risk is well known by people like yourself, it's still in use. Jean-Philippe. Yes, I know. I've been ranting about that for ages, and one problem is students. You have to teach students something, and Black-Scholes is so easy to teach, and it's so beautiful mathematically, that a lot of people just resent the idea of having to put it all down and start again with something more messy. Of course the world is messy, and being messy isn't much harder to teach, to focus on the right things. By definition, you have to form your intuition on something else than mathematics. That's why physics is good at that, because it gives you a lot of examples where you can put your hand in the dirt and try to push on some button and see what happens. But the same should be more and more true with economics and finance now, through two channels. One is the availability of data and the possibility to make experiments on data, simulations, that is. And even without data, you can do simulations. You can invent worlds of people trading according to some rule, or funds producing according to some rules, and implement whatever rule of thumb or feature of the world that you think should be there. And then just run the simulation and see what happens. Then, what's very striking when you do that, perhaps it's fun because you kind of play God, And second, very quickly you realize that some of the rules just don't work. They don't represent at all what is seen out there, and others seem to capture something that's very close to reality. So my impression is that by training people more and more with this type of background, this type of experimental background, experimenting with simulation is a strange notion, which even in physics it took a little time for people to accept that simulation was a legitimate way to do science. I don't know if you know Mark Buchanan, he's a science writer and he wrote a few years back something I like a lot. Just after the crisis in October 2008, he said the following, Done properly, computer simulation represents a kind of telescope for the mind, multiplying human powers of analysis and insight, just as a telescope does our powers of vision. With simulations, we can discover relationships that the unaided human mind, or even the human mind aided with the best mathematical analysis, would never grasp. For me, 
this is the essence of what the physics way of doing things has brought to the game. Michael. So, people don't think that you're giving an interesting marketing story about a physics background for your trading firm? Your firm does not hire traders? Jean-Philippe. Yes, it only hires physicists. And okay, people can think that. But we've been saying the exact same thing since the mid-90s. The everyday life of CFM is driven by data. It's banging our heads against data and trying to make sense of what we see and make models inspired by what we see. Another reason that it's not pure marketing is we're very strange as a trading firm to have published something like 100 science papers in the last 20 years, all published in academic journals, which shows that it's really in our DNA to consider science as the right way to do things. Michael Let's jump right into my primary reason for reaching out to you, which was seeing your paper, Two Centuries of Trend Following, see Chapter 20, which really didn't have any big fanfare. Just all of a sudden it appeared in the internet ether. I wonder if you might lay out a scenario for how that paper came to be and then we can discuss the specifics inside. Jean-Philippe This particular paper was in the back of our minds for a long time. There are two reasons for it to appear right now. One may fall in what you call marketing, which is that we're launching a fund called Institutional Systematic Diversified. And part of that fund is based on long-term trend following. So it is true that we needed to give some support to why we're doing that. The second thing is that we recently, in the course of the very last few years, have had access to much longer time periods than we had in the past. We've been able to go back to the beginning of the 19th century on commodities and indices in terms of data. This allowed us to backtest quite a number of ideas and in particular trend following. To our surprise, we realized that the strategy has been extremely consistent as long as we could go back in the past. This seemed to us to be a very interesting finding in the year where the Nobel Prize was given to Fama, Schiller, and Hansen. But this debate on the efficient market theory, on which I've been pretty vocal myself in the past ten years, it is ironic that it's given to Fama, who is still arguing there's no bubbles, there's no crashes, that the market went down in 2008 in anticipation of the crisis and not the other way around and that everything is perfect. Trend following, momentum in general, is something that efficient market theorists have a real difficulty to explain because that's completely out of the framework. It's very hard to evoke some kind of risk premium that would be associated with trend following. So it has to mean that markets are not that efficient. There's a lot of other clear discrepancies between theories and reality, but this one is a very genuine and clear one which talks to everybody. Just looking at the trend on a long time scale is giving information on the future motion of the market. It really means that all public information is not included in the price right now. For me, it's both an intellectual and commercial point of view a very interesting finding. Michael, that statement that jumped out to me was, and this is from your paper, the existence of trends is one of the most statistically significant anomalies in financial markets. That's a powerful statement. Jean-Philippe, we've been looking at financial markets in the last 20 years, and it's very hard to find extremely significant statistical effects. You can find them on the high-frequency side, but then there's a lot of murky things around high-frequency. First of all, costs are tremendous if you want to trade at high-frequency. It's not clear that all the high-frequency anomalies that have a strong statistical signature are, as economists would say, very relevant from an economics point of view. On the other hand, these are very slow trends where a lot of money can pile in and has piled in, is of course much more mind-boggling in a way, and also has to be taken into account both for academics, but also from the point of view of professionals. Michael Other interesting facts in the paper, perhaps this is obvious if data is going back to the early 1800s, but trend predates trend following, which I thought was interesting. It's actually a very small percentage of traders employing trend-following models that make up the volume. Jean-Philippe Yes, I agree. Well, you can see it both ways. I would say that traders on aggregate using trends is probably the reason why trends are there in the first place, and people using trends have been around for 200 years. That's my interpretation of what we see. There's a lot of people, even small people, who on aggregate play the role of trend followers and therefore create these trends. Michael, you mentioned Fama and the split Nobel Prize. 
I had a chance to speak with Harry Markowitz recently, who's very lucid, 89 years young now. And the point that I made, Harry, did you find it interesting that when you wrote back in the 1950s, this is what we should be doing, that within a few decades, other academics had taken what you said we should be doing and had said, this is what we are doing? His response was, I think you're going to have to talk to the behavioral economists about that. He didn't want to touch it, but his point is that I never said this is what it is. This is what we should be doing. Other people interpreted him to come up with these, as you might say, hard axioms that became rules, the foundation of the efficient market theory. Jean-Philippe. Yes, it is a strange field in the sense there's clearly interaction between what people do and what people observe, and the use of Black Shoals in 1987 is a rather vivid example of how things can go wrong when wrong models are used. That's what makes the subject fascinating for a physicist, because you have to go kind of one step further and try to understand how the models themselves might change the game. Actually, we came up with a simple model on how trend could lead to trend or mean reversion could lead to mean reversion. It's not clear that we could imagine a world where people would follow mean reversion rather than trends, but it seems that humans have such a propensity to follow trends. There's a lot of very interesting psychological experiments where you can show that when a small child sees three points aligning in a line, it gives him pleasure. We're wired to extrapolate past trends, and that's probably a way to extrapolate the motion of a tiger jumping on us or something that makes us alive today. My intuition is that it's much harder to go against the trend than it is to follow the trend. Again, there's a lot of very interesting psychological and even biological experiments showing there's a lot of things, for instance, hormones going in and out of our body in the two situations. One when we're conforming to the crowd, and the other when we're not conforming to the crowd. There's a pain associated with not conforming to what's going on. Michael Classical economics has no framework through which to understand wild markets, and wild is your phrasing. Could you talk to the idea of classical economics not having the ability to have a framework to see those wild markets, to see through them? And when you use the word wild, what does that mean to you? Jean-Philippe Yes, you're referring to a paper that I wrote, In Nature, which was just after the unraveling of the crisis, and this made me react very strongly because I felt that this was in the cards. And of course other people had seen it coming, but I was not too happy with the way economists had been dismissing all the attempts to introduce a little more wildness in the description of economic systems and financial markets. Actually, wild is the reference to Benoit Mandelbrot. Mandelbrot introduced fractals, of course. He's introduced also the idea of distributions without the second movement, without variance or infinite variance, and distribution with infinite means. That's his classification of randomness, if you want. He would call benign randomness, the ones that the economists love, Gaussian and things, where you can replace a heterogeneous system with its average. We know, for example, that this relates to Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, as well as that the distribution of anything in economics is so broadly distributed that very often it just doesn't make sense at all to replace a collection of people by an average people or a representative agent, would be the classical word. But coming back to Mandelbrot, benign randomness is the one that I just described, whereas wild randomness is the one that is difficult to tame, and it's difficult to tame because it's hard to speak about averages and variances. That's really what I was referring to when using the word wild. Now, why is economics in general not able to capture these big swings? It's very strange. It's because the models are constructed to be intrinsically stable. It's like people insist on the fact that a rational world is a stable world, and so your models should be stable. So models in economics came up with equilibrium points which are intrinsically stable. That is, if you perturb them by a small amount, they're going to naturally go back to the equilibrium. This is so much ingrained in the model that it's by definition impossible to have a crisis. What's interesting is when you remove a few of these rational assumptions and introduce market imperfections, then it's easy to find situations where the rational equilibrium of economics, even if it still exists, is actually unstable, and if it's deterred by small external shocks in such a way the system goes out of whack for a while, this is what we would call a crisis. Mathematical analysis is there to allow us to not only describe but anticipate to some extent 
or at least make space for, crisis in the economic world. And to me, this is a fascinating topic of research on which we've been focusing in the last few years. Michael, you sound like you're having fun with this subject. You get to wake up every day and have fun. Jean-Philippe, yes, exactly. That's totally true, and I'm happy you say that. Michael, what I have loved over the years, talking to you today and many of your peers, is that when one accepts uncertainty, there's a certain honesty to it. I feel a lot of discomfort when people are so certain about what's going to happen. Jean-Philippe, I think that's the big difference between physicists and economists, and there's a lot to be written about this. In a sense, I would say that we're privileged as physicists because we don't have to talk to politicians and we don't have to make statements about how the world is supposed to work in the sense that nobody's relying on us to make political decisions. I think there's a huge amount of pressure on economists because they're under the spotlight. They have to come up with stories and decisions, and this means that it's very hard for them to take a step back and say, okay, I'm really going to try to understand what's going on here, and maybe it's going to take me 10 years or 20 years, but at the end of the day, we'll have a better theory for the world. Okay, well, all this is great, but what am I going to say to my minister of finance when he asks me, should I raise tax or should I do this or that? It's true that it puts people in a bad situation because they can't think long term. And as you've just said, as physicists by training, what we love is to be able to think that we understand something. If we fail, well, it's okay. There's nothing wrong in failing. We know that physics has had so many revolutions and so many things that people were absolutely convinced were true turned out wrong in the end. It's an incredibly good backside against what you've said earlier, against certainty, and some form of arrogance as well. Michael, to a degree, you're expecting failure, and maybe the economists, they can't acknowledge there might be failure. Jean-Philippe, yes, because their theory's construction is completely different for sociological reasons as well. Michael, I appreciate you taking the time. Jean-Philippe, very happy to meet you someday. Of course, we like your book, Turtle Trader. As you saw, it's actually referenced in our paper, and I'm very happy to have been able to talk to you. If you have any questions, if you would like to know anything about my world, I'm easy to reach. Michael at Covell.com. That is C-O-V-E-L dot com. I look forward to hearing from you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.